So Sony sent over this ZV-1M2. It's just a loaner and this video isn't sponsored. I wasn't sure if I was even gonna make a video as I have so little to say about this camera, but I figured I'd share some of my test results for those interested. I've already covered the ZV-1 and the ZV-1F, and you probably already know almost everything you need to know if you've watched those videos. This is like the ZV-1F when it comes to the new stuff like a USB-C port, the layout, the updated menu system, etc. And it also has the new quarter 20 placement that's away from the card and battery door, which was a big issue with the original ZV-1. It's also got the priority displays for video that we've seen recently in other Sony cameras and most of the latest software bells and whistles like cinematic vlog mode and a self time for video. It does not have any of the new AI autofocusing stuff that we saw in the ZV-E1 though, as it doesn't have that dedicated chip. What makes it a ZV-1 Mark II though, is that it also has the built-in ND filter, a multi-interface shoe because the 1F just had a cold shoe, and it's got a zoom lens again, unlike the fixed lens for the 1F. The focal length is better though than the original ZV-1. Instead of a 24 to 70 full frame equivalent, we now have an 18 to 50, which is much more useful for vlogging, especially when you factor in the added crops of 4K and active stabilization on this camera. For further reach, you can have Sony's clear image zoom kick in after you reach that 50 millimeter equivalent for a greater zoom. But keep in mind that this is the old clear image zoom, so you will lose subject detection and eye tracking if you use it. However, I'd say the biggest weakness of this Mark II is that this new lens is not stabilized where the ZV-1's lens was. I'm finding I can see this present an issue in the vlog style shots, and I'll show you an example of that in a minute. But other than that, it's mostly the same camera as those other two. It's the same sensor and processor, so we're getting the same codecs, bit rates, and frame rates. It's still only 8-bit, so no s cinetone even in that cinematic vlog mode. You can shoot log, but I wouldn't expect stellar results compared to its bigger siblings. You're only gonna get 10 to 11 stops of usable dynamic range, regardless of what picture profile you choose. It has the same thermal performance of the ZV-1 and 1F and roughly the same battery life. I was getting about 80 minutes of 4K24 recording on a full battery, and I didn't experience any overheating when doing that in a 23C or 74 Fahrenheit environment, but expect worse results in hotter ambient temperatures. It also prompts you upon your initial setup to enable the high heat threshold to help with that. It does have the updated microarray with the intelligent direction switching like we saw on the ZV-E1, where you can use it to record audio from in front of the camera, behind it, or all around. And it can take the Sony microphones in the hot shoe or connect via 3.5 millimeter jack on the side. And of course, the rolling shutter performance is the same. Only this time, I was actually able to measure it as I didn't have my strobe when I reviewed the ZV-1. Regardless of shooting mode, I measured high 15s to low 16s in milliseconds for read speed, whether you shot in 1080p 60 or 4K24. What's interesting about this is that 16 milliseconds isn't a terrible result. I'd say it's right around the passing mark. Anything worse is a problem, but you can get by with 16 milliseconds. Yet when I reviewed the ZV-1F, I found the walking footage really hard to watch. So this new camera has actually helped me diagnose that issue. I think that these cameras need a stabilized lens if you want pleasing footage while vlogging. Now the ZV-1F's issue specifically was compounded by having a poorly tuned digital stabilization that was doing all kinds of wonky rolling stuff to the frame, and thankfully that seems to be fixed on this ZV-1M2. In fact, I'd say the active stabilization is quite good on this camera when shooting at the wider end, and it's not the rolling shutter that's causing problems, but it's the motion blur that doesn't match the movement of the frame. Here, let's do a vlog test and I'll show you what I mean. Oh, and for reference for the vlog test, I'm gonna be using this Sony handle, and I'll be holding it probably at about this distance with a little bit of a bent elbow, so you can get a sense of what the framing looks like. And I'm gonna be using the built-in microphone with the included dead cat on top of it. Let's go do it. Okay, here we go. We got pretty much everything on auto, auto white balance, auto focus. The image stabilization is set to active. It's the only mode. There is no standard stabilization, just digital or not, that's on. We've got the ND enabled, and we're still at f7.1 in order to manage the exposure out here on a bright sunny day. And I'm walking in and out between shadows. Uh, but you're not really gonna get much of a shallow depth of field if you gotta set your camera to f7.1 and you're shooting at 18 mil because I'm at the widest end of the lens here. For picture profile, I'm using the HLG with Rec. 709 color. I feel like that's a pretty good option to not make this 8-bit codec have to do too much. You don't wanna be shooting really wide color gamuts and trying to squish all that in on this camera. And I feel like this one looks pretty good right at a camera. Using the built-in mic, like I said, we got the dead cat on top. There is a dog barking over there and birds all around me that I can hear. So we'll see how it sounds. I am noticing though that it's actually really hard to see things on the display out here when it's sunny because this camera still has that issue where when you switch to 4K, the display gets dim and you can't use the sunny weather setting on the camera. So that's kind of annoying if you like to shoot 4K. And the 1080p is kind of mushy on this, so I would shoot 4K, but can't see the screen. 
Anyway, the motion blur issue that I'm talking about, I don't know if you've seen it yet so far, but when we talk about rolling shutter, we normally talk about this. See if I move the camera back and forth, kind of, you expect like the trees behind me to, you know, bend. They don't really do that. What happens instead is everything gets smeared. And basically what I'm thinking, you can see it if I do kind of like, let's say I do like really heavy, kind of, I'm, I'm like, don't walk like this, but if I kind of clomp around with the camera, what happens is everything in the frame is moving and getting motion blur, but then the frame itself is stabilized. So you're seeing a stable frame with like my eyes. If you try to just look at my eyes, you'll see that you can't really track them because they kind of get blurry up and down. And if I do do some kind of like weird movement like this, then the whole frame kind of smears. So that's the issue. I think it's not having a stabilized lens. So you're feeding a really unstabilized image to the sensor and then the sensor is just digitally cropping it. So the question is, what happens if we crank the shutter? Instead of cranking the f-stop to 7.1, what if we crank the shutter instead? Then we can shoot wide open, get that shallow depth of field. And maybe for the type of content creators that are doing this, this, this vlog, but maybe that's the bigger question. Does anybody even do this anymore? But let's say, is it okay to just crank the shutter and nobody cares anyway? Let's do that now. 1 640th of a second shutter, f1.8. Uh, and we're at base ISO now. So here we go, let's try the same test again. So just do a regular walk like this. Look at my eyes, see if they kind of look like they're smearing. It's gonna have a different look now. It's gonna be a little bit more lively and you know, frenetic with a higher shutter speed. But maybe people don't care. I don't know, maybe this is the right choice. You could always set it on aperture priority and just let the shutter speed be variable for you if you wanted. Uh, okay, and I'll do that little whippy pan test. This will probably be pretty gross, but it's not smearing as much, is it? So that might be a way to deal with, because I know when you use Catalyst Browse, which is like post-digital stabilization, that it has that same sort of motion blur issue. So the trick is to shoot at a bit of a higher shutter speed than you normally shoot, and then you can add motion blur back post-stabilization if you wanted to. So how does this look? 1 640th of a second. I'm still seeing zebras up there, so really I could probably go down an extra third of a stop. Also, the built-in ND is not the complete savior here. The fact that we're at 1 640th of a second I would say the ND is probably about a three stop ND, so that's not going to do the trick on a sunny day. I almost wish there was two degrees, maybe you could do like a, a three stop and a six stop or something, but might be asking too much for this size of body. Anyway, the last thing I wanted to talk to you about while we sort of observe if this is any better looking is, uh, what, the, what the hell is vlogging anyway? Do people still do this? Like, I, I don't see it very often. Is this still a thing where you're walking? Like, should we even be testing cameras if they're any good for this? Is rolling shutter that important? I feel like Sony, you know, they're, they're going hard on this word vlog and vlog can mean a lot to a lot of people, but maybe these days they just mean like content creation and that content creation might just be shot on a tripod vertically for, you know, short form content. And maybe that's just what they're trying to say. They're just trying to say content creator camera. And in that case, I mean, if that's what you're planning on doing, if you're planning on shooting this on a tripod, and it doesn't matter, you know? None of this stuff matters, it's all, it's gonna be fine. The screen brightness probably isn't gonna be an issue, rolling shutter isn't gonna matter, stabilization isn't gonna matter, the focal length is less relevant, you don't have to hold it. <laughs> Just put it on a tripod and again, get some good lights, get some good audio, problem solved, I guess. So that's my question to you, audience. Let me know in the comments, do you vlog? Do you see, do you watch a lot of content of people doing this, vlogging? Or do you think this whole vlog test and testing cameras for their ability to be, you know, whipped around is dead and we should move on instead to different type of tests for whatever the content creator is doing these days. Let me know what you think. At the end of the day, this is Sony's best option in the ZV-1 line and it really does seem like they listened to feedback on the ZV-1 to improve this camera. But it's also a pretty minor release in a lot of ways and I find it harder and harder to get excited about cameras like this when phones are becoming better and better options for the type of content creation that Sony is likely targeting with this product line. I often get asked about cameras in this price range and this new model doesn't really change my advice. If you have a reasonably modern phone, I'd instead spend the money on lights and audio. And if you already have that, I think you'd be much better off saving up for something like the FX30, which absolutely obliterates this camera and isn't a dead end when it comes to an upgrade path like the ZV-1 series is. But some people really love the ZV-1 and found a perfect use case for it. And I'm not trying to take that away from them. So if you've already considered all that and you've decided that this kind of point and shoot body is what you need for the content you're making, then you can get the M2 confidently because it's the best one they got. All right. 
I'm done.